it's too bad that this Memorial Day was rainy and gloomy for its entire length. But maybe it's appropriate as Memorial Day is a day of reflection. We remember our fallen soldiers and their greatest sacrifice, their lives, to preserve our way of life. While the philosophy of just war and the merits of a liberal republic as a system of governance will have to wait its turn, today's video is another historical event closer to home and our profession as endodontists. Today I want to talk to you about an important position paper published last week by the American Association of Endodontists. This position paper clarifies the association's position on vital pulp therapy, and while many people may have missed its significance, I figured we can spend a few minutes in this video talking about its permutations. Guys, let us sit over here. So let's sit over here and talk about this paper of AAE released on vital pulp therapy. So it's a position paper. Obviously, whenever we have a position paper released by an official body, it has permutations that are above and beyond what's recommended as science. Also, it has legal ramifications. So it's important to kind of read this and understand the verbiage and everything that's been discussed in here, because ultimately it has, in my opinion, really historical consequences for our profession. So vital pulp therapy has been something that has always been talked about. Clearly, we know that um, people have been doing pulp capping indirectly. Direct pulp capping has historically been questionable. Lots of studies have come out with historical use of DICAL and other types of calcium hydroxide based vital pulp therapy agents, and the success rate was always unpredictable. Recently, the use of more vital pulp therapy, and more importantly, in my opinion, also a better understanding of the mechanisms of failure in these types of vital pulp therapy cases, which is the importance of proper isolation, carry control, removal of all decay, have really shed new light into potential ways we can improve the outcome of these type of vital pulp therapy cases. Also, new calcium silicate cements have been extremely helpful in terms of providing us with the antisepsis that the calcium hydroxide does provide, but also more biocompatibility as these materials set to hydroxyapatite, creating a type of a hydroxyapatite surface layer that will interface with these um, cells in the pulp and can have far better biocompatibility. So with that, let's take a quick look at the introduction portion of the association is talking about what vital pulp therapy is and that it's previously been associated with apexogenesis, but now we're talking about using and then mostly in uh, kind of younger teeth with underdeveloped uh, apices, but now we're moving on to its use potentially in um, adult teeth with closed apices as potential means of uh, getting success cases. So this statement made by use to any practitioner in assessing whether they have the appropriate expertise and armamentarium to perform vital pulp therapy in appropriate selected cases. So one of the key things here in this paper is that they are recommending the use of the microscope for the use of vital pulp therapy for reasons of better examination of the pulp surface. So if there are any potential you know, areas that you have necrosis, you can see that a little bit better with higher magnification and the analysis of the condition of the pulp at higher magnification and better illumination. So the microscope has been recommended in this particular paper. Now, in terms of diagnostic considerations, the key here is like any treatment, your number one source of success is always your treatment planning. And your treatment planning is very much dependent on your proper diagnosis. So arriving at the right diagnosis is a key way you're going to be able to achieve a higher success rate in these types of cases. And the terminology that was previously designed as normal, reversible, or irreversible papyrus, and with irreversible being branched into symptomatic and asymptomatic, is perhaps requires some type of revision. And we know that the recent ESE, the European Society of Endodontists, announced some newer definitions of irreversible papyrus. And uh, this is what the AAE is talking about as well. So potentially the idea of having cold sensitivity or a lingering response to cold alone may not necessarily indicate a cutoff line for doing pulpectomy versus some type of a vital pulp therapy. So let's just quickly go back historically is that we had this demarcation between reversible and irreversible and all irreversible cases had to then get full pulpectomy and had to have full root canal therapy. But with this type of a paper now we're told that the two main predictors of irreversible papyrus, which would have triggered the all or none response 
of pulpectomy versus no root canal therapy was the idea of spontaneous pain and lingering response to cold may not necessarily mean that irreversible pulpitis and that irreversible pulpitis may not necessarily mean full pulpectomy. So at this point with this paper, the AAE, American Society of Adonis, is opening up a can of worms that allows you to have subjective interpretation of the gradation and the temporal aspects of irreversible pulpitis so that you can make a clinical judgment at the time of treatment whether root canal therapy full pulpectomy is indicated or whether you can achieve a more minimally invasive approach to the main goal of ridding the patient of symptoms and achieving essentially keep getting the tooth back into function as the main goal why patients come and see us patients don't come and see us to have root canal therapy they come and see us to address symptoms that can be achieved now based on the AAE and this paper not just by doing full pulpectomy but in specific cases at specific times when irreversible pulpitis has not spread out throughout the pole through partial pulpectomy or rather if you want to think of it partial pulpotomies at different levels and for that what I'm going to do at the end of this video this is just a kind of introduction to the paper I'm going to do a second part where I'm going to actually go a little bit through some of the pathophysiology by going back to the office standing in front of a little board and just kind of doing a little old school drawing to explain this stuff to you so previously we've been doing pulp sensibility testing, which has been just the cold and the hot, but we never have really known what is pulp vitality because that requires some type of an oxygen tension. And we've used lingering pain, which has been essentially a trigger of the C-fiber nerves that are more in the pulp proper. This again has been the status of irreversible pulpitis. But now with the research that has been more recently done over the past 10 years by doctors, uh, you know, Rutschenberg and uh, Walters and Recucci and others that have shown that perhaps what's happening with pulpitis and what we call irreversible pulpitis is not an all or not response and that perhaps irreversible pulpitis is in fact a local phenomenon and that its gradation and the way it does spread kind of reflects more or less what happens in the dentin with the infected and affected dentin as well as normal dentin. The same thing is actually a follow through of that from hard mineralized tissue of dentin into the pulp. We'll do that again at the board where I'm going to share with you some of my ideas on that. So what essentially they're saying now is that perhaps this um, techniques that we've done previously which has been the elimination of the entire pulp may not be necessary maybe we can just remove the pulp up to the extent which is infected and affected and then underneath there we have normal pulp and perhaps that portion could remain vital inside the tooth and that's really the promise of vital pulp therapy so anywhere from a area of a direct pulp cap all the way to different gradations of pulpotomy inside the tooth to the orifice and even perhaps even halfway down the canal this is kind of all of a sudden allowing a whole different language and a whole different way of looking at the disease of pulpitis now of course many of the patients we see in clinically at the office are already beyond the state where the pulp has already been necrotized and is dead in those cases clearly we have to do pulpectomy but what this this paper does is all of a sudden legitimizes vital pulp therapy as a potential and um, highly effective method of addressing cases of irreversible pulpitis in early cases. So the key here is to have a proper diagnosis and here it leaves a lot of kind of leeway for people to interpret. I think uh, the idea that uh, if you're having lingering pain on its own may not necessarily indicate the fact that you need to do a full pulpectomy and perhaps here what they're indicating is that one approach would be let's go and see because what they're using as a method of deciding where does that gradation of the pulp necrosis stops and the normal pulp begins it's a thing, essentially a proxy which is bleeding so but, but what I mean by proxy is that it's not an actual indication of tissue damage but we're using something else to make a decision about something else for example when you take a radiograph you are looking at bone loss and you're inferring infection so you never take a radiograph and see infection clearly is because infection is a soft tissue disease whereas radiographs can only capture heart tissue and mineralized tissue density so when we see bone resorption in areas that we would not expect bone loss we infer infection as a differential diagnosis of course there could be other things as well but this is what we call a proxy and in the case of 
of pulpitis and vital pulp therapy, we're going to use something that we can clinically use and that's bleeding. So where you can control the bleeding, that indicates that you probably have reached normal pulp. Of course, the most idealistic way of knowing where you have reached vital pulp and what is infected and what is not is to probably use some kind of molecular assays or other methods of uh, using indicators of infection and inflammation, but until we have something that can be used inexpensively chair side, we're going to have to use something that is less indicative, such as bleeding, as a proxy. So what you're going to do is you're going to remove the pulp to the extent where you see the inflammation and then apply hypochlorite uh, on a cotton pellet or on a Teflon tape or whatever you prefer, but you're going to essentially try to use a little bit of compression lightly and the hypochlorite to disinfect the site. And the goal is to keep that for a few minutes in there so that you can have it dry or at least get a coagulum form. And then on top of the coagulum, when you do, you can assume that perhaps the rest of the tissue is vital and you would be placing a layer of a calcium silicate bioceramic. Now, there have been a lot of research that has been done on the use of MTA and MTA is a great product for that uh, purpose. Unfortunately, the downside of the MTA is its handling properties and the fact that it contains bismuth oxide. So it can, especially in the anterior area and in areas that are aesthetically visible, it could cause discoloration of the root. Then a, a other material that is also very good, it doesn't cause staining, it's biodentine, and that's been used for this purpose as well. It's a calcium carbonate based material. And uh, that is great too. That requires trituration, uh, but it would work well. And some people don't like the its lack of radio opacity. And then the third material that has been also proven for this uh, technique is the use of the calcium silicate biceramic endosequence putty and the uh, flowable RM cement material. And of course, in all disclosure, I've had a hand in developing that product. The advantage of that product is that it's pre-mixed and it's a little bit easier to handle. It doesn't cause staining, just like the biodentine. And it's another good alternative for this area. So essentially, the goal here is to create a coagulant we know from the studies that, uh, and also the laboratory work, that the bleeding time for most people is anywhere from two to seven minutes. So applying pressure to a site anywhere from two to five, or if needed up to seven minutes, should create a coagulum for the average person. If it doesn't, it indicates that most likely there is additional inflammation. Of course, it's very important for you to pay attention to the patient's medical history, if they are taking anticoagulants and other reasons that could systemically cause more bleeding and that could confuse the results here. It's important to kind of pay attention to that. So here in this paper, they essentially talk a lot about the use of the calcium silicate cements as one of the favorable materials. But I want to indicate again, while calcium silicate cements are critical and very, very important as the materials of choice for these types of applications anywhere from pulp capping to various levels of uh, pulpotomy, the more important part is your aseptic technique. That's the most important indicator of success. What you need to consider is the reality that you have to make sure you have, number one, removed all decay, all of the infected and even the affected dentin in the area, and also obviously the pulp, and prevent any of that material from pouring into the remaining portion of the pulp. Make sure you have very good isolation with the rubber dam and you're not allowing any contamination from the curricular fluid and from you know the saliva obviously into the site so there has to be a certain deliberate attempt at doing vital pulp therapy before you attempt to get in there it's not one of those let's go and see without a rubber dam using any of these recent isolite and other types of isolation materials as technique of choice you have to be as meticulously clean as possible you have to be as sterile as in the operating room if not more at the research laboratory level you have to be that clean and meticulous and you can achieve great success right if you do that so of course in the hands of the most people that may not happen and then you will end up seeing a far different picture in terms of the success of these procedures clinically than you may see from the research that has been done under very meticulous laboratory conditions kind of reminds me of some of the original implant studies that were done under really meticulous laboratory conditions conditions and clinical conditions by the expert in the right patients at the right time compared to later on what became kind of open season for them to be done in all types of cases. So you will quickly see a lower success rate when that happens. Essentially, as a summary here, they were actually saying that you can place an immediate restoration in these cases. In the case of these calcium silicate cements, if, whether you're using MTA or if you're using biodentine or if you're using uh, the putty and the from bioceramics, even with biodentine, the actual final setting time of these materials are far longer. So the non-surgical lid technique 
which I have mentioned in previous videos is going to be the technique of choice. As I've mentioned previously, the BC uh, liner, which is a material I've helped develop, would be a perfect type of a lid technique material that can go over the calcium silicate, which will then act as a transition material with your final restorative material that you can then place on top of that because it allows you to light cure the liner on top of the bioceramic and immediately move on to place your final restoration. So in summary, what they say in this paper is that um, the key here is the primary goal is to preserve the pulp and that always is a noble thing. That's what we want to do. And that in order to, to do that technique wise, we need to have good visualization techniques with the microscope to be able to remove all of the infected tissue and then on the remaining portion of it make sure we control the bleeding and then place a calcium silicate cement material and then we can even proceed to place a final restorative material right at the same visit. If it's a questionable case, you can use a technique that I've mentioned before, which means you can bulk fill with the BC liner all the way to the top of the tooth. That gives you a very nice seal with this premixed material that is uh, bioactive in its own right and has been optimized to work with the bioceramics. And it can give you a good eight weeks, which is a good comfortable waiting time period for you to have a good effective seal of a material, which is above and beyond IRM and Cavit, and then wait and see how things go and if you have no symptoms then you can proceed to place your final restorative material by cutting into it and place your final restoration. So this technique said that you know they're essentially saying that the, the procedural decisions for the amount of pulp tissue retention or removal should be based on operator assessment, clinical judgment, overall treatment plan and the patient's general oral and systemic health status. So there is a lot of subjectivity going on into the recommendations that they have made. That is a double-edged sword. I'm not sure if it's good or bad. I would love to hear your feedback at the bottom of this video about what you think is um, the potential here. But I think, as I've mentioned before in a few different posts and other videos, is that this, I think, is a historical moment in, in our profession where previously where we had a zero or none, which was no endo and endo, is now all of a sudden we're in this subjective area where we can make certain decisions based on proper diagnosis and treatment planning for given patients. That could be potentially a win-win-win, including for patients who would like to have more vital pulp therapy, preserving their pulps rather than having a full pulpectomy or root canal therapy. This could be in some of the videos and cases that I've done in the past be described as a root preserving type of procedures. And I will do some videos on that in the future to explain how that works out. But I think more importantly for us in the profession, this could be a moment that could be akin to what oncology and uh, you know plastic surgery went through uh, several decades ago on medicine side, where previously the treatment for breast cancer was radical mastectomy in almost 100% of the cases. And this, while it was fairly effective, uh, it created obviously other side effects that were undesirable for patients. And it wasn't really until more research showed the potential for doing a limited lumpectomy compared to a full mastectomy, where the lumpectomy became a viable option for many patients. And that really the key here has been early detection. And I feel, and that's my personal view looking at the macro, you know, 30,000 foot down, is that what we need to do in this profession is we need to start to emphasize more the goal and division of promoting prevention as the essence of endodontics. Endodontics has historically been defined as the prevention and treatment of diseases of endodontic or pulpal origin. And we haven't really been emphasizing enough the idea of prevention. And I think in this case, if we can then cast cases early enough and communicate adequately with our patients about the importance of early detection. Much like our colleagues in oncology with the treatment of breast cancer and prostate cancer in the early detection situations, hopefully we can help reduce the onset of more radical treatments and at least have an extra option in some of these cases to deal with. There are several potential ramifications of this, which we're going to talk about in future videos, uh, specifically also the economics of it and how can we square that issue in terms of the continued of care and the different levels of pulpectomy, pulpotomy, to pulpectomy, and, and, and so on, and risk management, which is another key component of this whole thing. But also, I think another area that is important to recognize is that in order to have good success rates, we need to change our views from the past of just removing some of the decay. We need to be more radical in removing all of the decay so that pulp vitality can be preserved and contamination can be reduced and vital pulp therapy can potentially work. This is an exciting area. There's a lot of things to talk about. 
in the next video what I want to do is I want to just kind of go over uh, to the board and talk to you a little bit about how does this work, how is it done, and just to talk to you a little bit about pulp biology component of this procedure. All right, guys, I'll see you in the next video where we're going to go to the board and talk about that. I'm going to break this down to two videos for that reason. Meanwhile, please write down below this video what your ideas is, whether you agree or disagree with what I said in this uh, video in terms of the vision and the ideas. Alrighty, see you in the next video.